relationships that really are greatest mirrors. Whatever you're trying to seek from the other person, you can give to yourself. Hello, my loves. Welcome back to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. It's Eileen. So today's episode is jam-packed with amazing advice on self-love, healing your self-worth, manifesting relationships, and ultimately coming back to your most authentic self. Our guest today is Jasmine Lipska. Jasmine is an intimacy and relationship coach, author, and host of the Jasmine Lipska Podcast. She guides women in healing shame and becoming fully expressed so that they can create healthy, secure, and conscious relationships. So Jasmine's been on the podcast before. I'll link her previous episode in the show notes. She's a dear friend and I know you're going to enjoy this episode. So here is Jasmine Lipska. Hello, Jasmine. Welcome back to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. I'm so happy to have you. Yes. Thank you for having me back. It's exciting to speak again. (laughs) Yes. It's been a while since we spoke, um, but for listeners who don't exactly know who you are, do you want to run us through your journey of self-love? And and I want to hear like how you evolved into an intimacy and relationship coach. Yeah. Yeah, sure. So my journey began back in 2017 when I posted my first YouTube video that kind of went viral as you would say and I started to grow a community there and then that led to me dropping out of uni quitting my part-time job because they were not bringing me any joy of any form and you may have spoken about human design before on the podcast and my human design is a generator. I thrive off things that light me up, like really light up my soul. So I need to do things like that. YouTube was bringing me that at the time. And I was making more money than my part-time job as well from YouTube, which is super exciting. So I was like, oh my gosh, I can actually do this. I can actually create a life of freedom through YouTube. So I did that for about four years or so. And then in 2020, I graduated from a life coaching course that I took for six months and I started doing coaching and I discovered coaching back when I was solo traveling, which by the way, solo traveling is just so amazing for self-discovery. I know you've done it before, Eileen, and it's Mm -hmm. just, I recommend it to everyone. How long (laughs) did you solo travel actually? Yeah, that was four and a half months. I I didn't plan it at all, but it just happened to end at four and a half months because I got food poisoning. My phone was stolen. I was like, okay, it's time to get back home. (laughs) Wow. And where did you travel through for the listeners who don't know about that? Yeah. So it was Bali, Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam, kind of um, Asia. Yeah. I love it. Sounds like a dream. I'm sure a lot of people, (laughs) that's a whole other story. And were you also creating content as you were traveling? That's right. Yeah. So I was creating travel videos and I just really, I was just so determined to create a life where I can do what I love every day, travel, have location freedom and make the world a better place through sharing videos. So Mm -hmm. yeah. I love that. Now let's talk about how you started to transition into being an intimacy and relationship coach. Yeah. Yeah. So Intimacy and relationship coaching are things I do, but in general, I'll call it more like transformation coaching because I also touch on, you know, mindset and everything that allows women to get from where they are to what they where they want to be. Like that is my ultimate passion, transforming you to really creating a life that is wilder than your wildest dreams. And so that happened when, yes, I graduated from a life coaching course and I started taking on clients and I just really found so much purpose and joy, just my dharma in that. So I continued doing that. And then eventually, almost over a year ago, I quit YouTube to really give my all into coaching. And yeah, I just kind of shifted out of YouTube, didn't find as much love in it anymore. So yeah. I mean, touch on that decision because I'm sure that wasn't easy, like an easy choice to make. Because I I mean, I knew you as a YouTuber. So how did it feel like quitting something that was a big part of who you were at that time? Yeah, it was a bold decision for sure because a lot of the thoughts going on in my head was like, oh my gosh, what if people say like, what a waste, like just their opinions and stuff. But then I realized I need to do what's best for me, of course, and place my happiness first. And it just felt really right. Like there was a sort of 
peace coming to that decision. And you know what's your intuition when it feels more at peace rather than like a, a fearful, a fearful vi- vibration in your body when you're making a decision. So I love that. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm yeah. so glad I made that decision because it really just took my coaching to another level. So I see. I want to dive into more of your self-love journey as well, because I think you have an inspiring story. Like you recovered from eating disorder. You had a lot to, you know, a lot of a journey going through like self-worth and healing that. So can you talk, talk about that? Yeah, for sure. So yes, eating disorders, body dysmorphia, all of that was... All like your entire childhood or teenage years? Map it out for us. Yeah, more teenage years. Mm -hmm. So when I was about 16, started having a rough relationship with food. And it was, for me, it was a form of control because I felt so out of control in other areas of my life, such as friendships at school and how people perceived me. I felt like I couldn't control that at all. So instead, I went to control food because we all liked to find some form of control in our lives when we're attached to getting our worth from something so for me my worth was then coming from how my body looked like so then I controlled food as well and that was until 2019 when I really started to go on this healing journey within heal my mind and then heal my body and that was a whole journey within itself the healing journey I think maybe a lot of people may think that okay, you just choose to recover, everything will be better. It'll just be like this straight linear line for healing, Mm -hmm. but it's not like that at all. It's easy to relapse sometimes and it's really, it's a lot of devotion and commitment to healing and your body can fluctuate a lot like mine did. Yeah. Lots of fluctuation because your body is like, what's happening now? You're giving me all the food, like more food now. What's happening? What's happening? It just, Mm -hmm. you need to embrace this transition time of fluctuation, ups and downs, it's all part of the process. And how did you keep going? I'm sure a lot of people are ha- have a they struggle with their relationship with food and their body image. So how like what kind of helped you go through that process of healing? Yeah, so in terms of support, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean what what helped you get through versus just falling back on your old habits and old beliefs? Mm, yeah I love this question so what came to mind was I remember coming across this I don't know where it was from but this shift in mindset which was you know in our female body everything we tell her everything we feed her give her affects our eggs we're born with all of our eggs inside of our ovaries and one of my greatest dreams is to become a mum one day and I realized well everything I'm telling myself affects the eggs, you know, vibrationally, energetically, and how I'm treating my body will affect my eggs as well. And if I'm able to have children in the future, and I really want to have children, so I, that, just thinking of something outside of me, like not how I look or whatever, but something great, like a greater purpose, allowed me to keep going. Like I would love to have a healthy body. Yes, for me, of course, to thrive so I can thrive in my relationships and life and my business, but also so I can have children one day and also be a great role model for my mm-hmm. children, especially if I have a daughter one day. So just yeah. thinking, thinking of something outside of your greater purpose can also really help. I love that. Um, do you have tips for other people who are listening, just you know, how to heal their sense of self-worth? Mm. So in terms of self-worth, it's funny what we can attach it to. So I would say if you feel like you, you experience low self-esteem, low self-worth, well, what, what have you been attaching your worth to? Is it achievement? Is it relationships? Is it how your body looks like? And why? And get really clear on why your identity is wrapped around this particular area of your life. And don't forget to also look at who are you without this thing? Who are you without the achievements? Who are you without the body, without the relationship? Because you're so much more than that. And sometimes we forget. We can Mm -hmm. tend to attach our worth to one thing in particular. Like for me, it was achievements for so much of my life. I forgot who I was outside of that. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So thinking about that and focusing on that as well, getting satisfaction from other things in life can help you start reclaiming your worth. I love that. Um, 
And I mean, let's talk more about inner child healing, because I think you talk a lot about that in your content. So what does it take and what does it mean to heal that inner child? Yeah, so inner child healing, for the audience who may not know what it is, your inner child is a psychological part of the brain. Um, I like to visualize her inside of your heart space. Um, and she's that child part of you, that part of you that has needs, um, like basic needs, but also needs love, needs attention sometimes, need, the needy part of you. And also wants to play, wants to have fun, be creative, you know, the child part of you. So embracing and healing your inner child isn't about being childish. That's a different thing. It's about connecting with that child part of you so that you can still enjoy life and play and have fun and meet your own needs. It's really important for our self-worth and self-love. So your inner child can show up in many ways in your life and being aware of how she shows up um, can help you be aware of the cause of certain patterns in your life. For example, one of my patterns used to be chasing unavailable men, like forcing, not forcing, but kind of wanting men to to like me, to love me, mm -hmm. getting my worth from men's validation. And that was my inner child because she didn't get all the love she needed from her parents. And so then as an adult, she started chasing that from other men. Mm -hmm. So things like that, being aware of your inner child can help you to break patterns that no longer serve right. you. And just what is the process though, of like being aware of your patterns and starting to break it? I want you to walk me through how you healed or the things that you do. Yeah. So going back to that example, then yeah. the anxious attachment, chasing unavailable men, I, so I just became aware that, okay, that's, that's actually little Jasmine. She's craving the love she didn't get as a child. And she's now placing her worth in men and getting validation from being chosen, like forcing them kind of to like me or persuading mm -hmm. them, convincing them. Um, then when I became aware of that, I started talking to her and connecting to her. And ways you can do that include writing letters, meditation, getting a photo of her and looking at her, speaking to her. And I just went within and I, and I told her, you know, Jasmine, you're enough, you're worthy. You don't need to make someone like you to feel worthy. You can choose mm -hmm. to feel worthy now and just kind of tending to her, like being mm -hmm. the good mother to my inner child because mm. that's who we are now we get to be the good mothers to her or good father if you're um, a guy yeah. listening to this um yeah. and when I went through that then I started becoming really aware of this pattern showing up again I remember it did I started to kind of chase someone who was emotionally unavailable not ready for a relationship and I was like hmm okay I'm aware now Jasmine I didn't have to continue down this path because I can give myself the validation I'm seeking from him through things like just being kinder to myself, um, giving myself compliments throughout the day, just treating myself like a queen mm, <laughs> to I love that. validate myself, validate my own emotions. Just, just because when we're chasing unavailable men, it's kind of like you're, you feel like your existence depends on someone else choosing you. But that doesn't mm -hmm. have to be the case at all when you start valuing your own existence yourself. So that's kind of how I broke that pattern. Yeah, I love that. So, my life. Oh, and I want to get into that. But before we do, I mean, I just want to point this out because I'm sure a lot of listeners can relate to what you're talking about. Even, even I can. Like when I was going through my teen years, I didn't get the attention or love that I wanted from my parents. And it's it, I think it's something that was game changing is to recognize that what you're chasing in another person, what you want from another person is usually like what you should give yourself, right? It's, it's the stuff that you're lacking in your life. You think you need to get it from someone else. And that's why people chase relationships. They think you need to be with someone to make you whole, but really you can fill that part of it yourself. You can fill that hole yourself with like what you said, treating yourself like a queen or for example, for an example in my life is like, oh, I wish my boyfriend did this for me. Or I wish he took me out on dates to like these kinds of dates or to those kinds of places. But like, I can do that for myself. You know, I can plan a day, take myself to the museum. Like there are so many things that you can give to yourself. You don't really need to wait for someone else to give it to you. Yeah. Oh, so, so true. Relationships yeah. are really our greatest mirrors. Whatever you're trying to seek from the other person, you can give to yourself. And especially for those who may 
struggle with fear of abandonment, um, anxious attachment in relationships. You know, the things that you're afraid of being abandoned for are the things you're abandoning within yourself. So let's Mm. say you feel like you fear that your partner will abandon you for your sensitivity because you're too emotional or something. You're the one rejecting it within yourself. That's why you Mm. fear they will leave you for it. So it's just seeing relationships as mirrors is a, it's a game changer. (laughs) It's such a huge life teacher. (laughs) Like you, yeah, there, I feel like we can go really deep in that, but before, before we do that, I want to hear about your story. What made you decide to move to Bali? And I want to hear your story of meeting Josh. Yeah, so I traveled to Bali quite a few times um, during, you know, when I was filming YouTube videos and all of that. And I just fell in love. I just, and I just loved it so, so much. And I remember I was, after a Bali trip, I was in the Philippines. And I just, I was, even though I was in the Philippines, I loved it, but I was reminiscing on my Bali trip every day. And then a thought suddenly came to my mind. I'm like, why don't I just, live there like why do I have to go home to Melbourne why can't I just live there I can I'm 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 location independent and that clicked for me and so straight away I booked a one-way flight to Bali and because I did that then um so I had planned to go back to Bali in January of 2020 to go there indefinitely but then in December 2019 I already I already had a trip booked anyways to go back to Bali briefly and it was during that time that I was like you know what I'm gonna come back to Bali anyways long term why don't I just try Bumble just get to know see if I can get to know start getting to know some people like men especially because I also was on the path to healing my relationship with men because I went to all girls school Mm. and then after high school I dropped out of uni so I was always kind of quite awkward around men and things like that. Mm. So Bumble was also that way of me just getting back into the dating scene and getting comfortable with men again. So I did that and then I happened to match with Josh (laughs) and then we met up the next day and it was really, really great date. And I really just, I was like, wow, I feel really great with him. So I went back to Melbourne and I came back. We met up in Bali again and the rest is history. (laughs) It seemed like it happened so fast. <laughs> I, and so Josh was already live in, living in Bali at that time? Yeah, he was. <laughs> I mean, can, what were the signs that led you to feel like, okay, this is the one I'm going to commit to him? Because you decided to get married very soon after dating, right? Yeah, so we got engaged 10 months afterwards. And then mm-hmm. two months after our engagement, literally one year of our, when we um we're in a relationship, we got married. So it was all within mm-hmm. one year. And yeah. what was just, what felt so right at the start was, well, he was emotionally available. That was a big mm-hmm. one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I loved having deep conversations with him, you know, and he was okay with talking about emotions and being sensitive. And I think a lot of men are afraid to talk about that. And that's a whole other topic. That's kind of programmed in the DNA. But for him, I just loved seeing how he was in touch with his healthy masculine and he and he's an entrepreneur as well and determined in that way has goals and wants to make the world a better place and he's kind and pathetic all these valleys all these things that I wrote down on the list before I met him was him even the blue eyes like to the point of blue eyes muscular body it was that detailed that he was everything else manifesting (laughs) yeah let's talk about that part because I yeah, you apparently manifested your ideal partner through like scripting and all of these. Can you tell our listeners about that? What did you do? And how did you know you were ready to meet that kind of person? Because you were still healing your relationship with men, right? Yeah, yeah. So I kind of surrendered to that part. Like when it would happen, I mm-hmm. surrender. I trust. I always knew from when I was a little girl, God would bring me that person one day. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I just got because I'm so some people aren't so specific and l- like details when it comes to scripting and that's totally okay because it won't work for everyone in my human design I'm a specific manifester and I've got two gates about details I'm a very detail oriented <laughs> person so if you are if you like the details and being specific this is a great practice for you just got really clear on what his values are, what the values we share, his characteristics, personality, the things we do together. I did go to the uh, the detail of like how he looks like just for fun, mm-hmm. but I did surrender on that. Um, yeah. 
And and then it happened that it was it wasn't like immediately. I probably wrote this. Yeah. What? When beginning. did you write? Okay. Uh, yeah, beginning of 2019. And I met him at the end. So. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> manifesting your ideal partner is all about for you is about getting detailed, kind of like laying everything out, characteristics, um, both personality and physical, but then you just surrender when it happened. Yeah. Yeah. And most importantly, just being that energetic match to it. Mm -hmm. So for example, I needed to learn to no longer tolerate certain things. Like I'm no longer going to tolerate someone being emotionally unavailable or Mm -hmm. like just certain things. And that raises your standard and become, you become more of an energetic match to that ideal partner. Yeah. Right. I love it. Cause I do feel like you guys are a very good match. Like you found someone with same values. Like it's, I'm, I'm really happy for you. And I'm sure listeners who are, you know, maybe they are where you were before. They want to know how to find that, <laughs> how to attract their ideal person. So yeah. Um, and then continue on your journey like with Josh li- living in Bali? Because I do feel like I've seen you evolve and transform as as you were there in the past couple of years. Like what, what were you going through? Oh, great question. So I feel like, hmm, the biggest transformation I'd say that I've gone through is to stop being that good girl. Mm. And it just feels so liberating. I'm actually working with a coach myself right now who's really supporting me in in embodying potent leadership and just letting go of the people pleasing that I'd been so used to my whole life. I grew up as a good girl. And that's Mm -hmm. one reason why I quit YouTube because I feel like through YouTube, I mean, I I really am grateful for it, appreciate the journey. Um, But then I, I realized it wasn't serving me also because I was really depending on the validation I was getting Mm. to keep being someone I really wasn't like the good girl. I really tried so hard to please everyone. Mm -hmm. Clearly it still didn't please everyone because I was still getting hate and stuff like that. So that was like, okay, I'm trying to please everyone, but still not happening. What's happening here? And I realized Mm -hmm. that it's really like people pleasing tendencies, being the good girl, all of that. So I've really guess in the past two years I really just started to shed the parts of me that aren't truly me that I just put on to try be liked and approved by everyone so the journey has really been validating myself approving of myself falling deeply in love with myself first Mm -hmm. and foremostly and it's yeah it's been very liberating and And coming back into my (laughs) Yeah. As a recovering people pleaser myself, and I'm sure some a lot of listeners can relate, how can you tell which parts are the true you versus the parts that you put on? Because it's I think for a lot of us it's so ingrained in our in who we are that it's hard to separate that. So how did you do that? Yeah, that can be a tricky one for sure. And it, it takes time to get to know your habits and behaviors, but it's really about self-awareness and getting clear on, okay, why am I doing this right now? Why am I saying yes? Why am I doing what I do? And just Mm -hmm. questioning that more. The quality of your life depends on the quality of questions you ask yourself. So just kind of getting to the root of why, you know, why do you desire that? Why do you do this? Yeah. Right. It's like analyzing every decision that you make or every thought that you have, like, is this really what I want? Or is this, is is there a people pleasing reason behind this? Yeah. Yeah. And it's not that you have to overthink everything, Mm -hmm. but it's more about doing this, like doing this for your happiness and your fulfillment and just making sure that what you're doing isn't because you want to please someone or look a certain way to someone else, be perceived a certain way. It's because it just feels really good for you. Mm -hmm. Is that your compass? Like, I guess, how can you describe what your compass is for every decision you make or thing that you do? Mm, It feels good in my body and Mm -hmm. it feels like I'm being my most unapologetic self. I love that. Thanks for sharing that. I, I, I like to have kind of those guiding questions or affirmations like, say yes if your whole body feels like it's a yes like if you're if you're unsure which me I'm very indecisive <laughs> like a lot of the times you're unsure that likely means it's a no so i that's something that i've been trying to practice too oh yes i love that yeah, yeah. and i'll just add one more to that mm-hmm. as you spoke it reminded me another 
guiding compass for me is I ask myself, will this lead to resentment? Because <laughs> it will lead to oh. resentment. As a no. <laughs> oh, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. That's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I've also like, I guess what I've been seeing through your posts is you really accepting and embracing you, everything that you are. And I've seen you like you've talked, you're talking about more like just sensual topics and you're getting just very open and comfortable with yourself. And I find that very inspiring. So how do you feel opening up more on social media, knowing that you have friends or peers or even family watching? Yeah, well, yeah, for me, it's like, so what? Like, so what if they're uh-huh. watching? And <sighs> here to I pave the way, yeah, to, because it's so, rest- it feels constricting and, and it doesn't feel good, right? When we're constantly thinking, oh, what will my family think? What will my friends think? Mm-hmm. We're doing, you're doing, you're doing not yourself a favor or anyone else a favor by shrinking yourself, playing small. So, yeah, I'm like, so what? <laughs> I guess I love that. I love that you've gotten there because I it's it's still tough for me. I still, even though I talk so much about how to stop caring about what other people think of you, there's so many layers to that. And I do feel like I have like there are certain things I don't want to share online because I care about, oh, what if my family sees this or or something like that. So what is your what are your thoughts or your advice for people who are are paralyzed by that fear? Yeah, yeah. I love this topic so much. So the best thing I would always say is do that thing, face the fear and, and do it anyways. But when in doing that, become aware of what particular judgments you are afraid of or what judgments you hold on to. So let's say you post something, let's say sensual, and then your family texts you and they're like, why did you do that? Don't be like too much or something. Let's say too much comes up and you hold on to that. You're triggered. Great. Perfect, amazing. Triggers are your best friend. So yeah, love it. <laughs> aware of it. Why are you holding on to it? Because the things you hold on to are the things that you likely believe to be true about yourself. Because Eileen, if I told you you're a neg, you're gonna be that's gonna just go over your head in one ear out the other, because you know you're not a freaking egg. But if I say, <laughs> Eileen, you're too much, ooh, and you're triggered, that could trigger you. Right. Probably right. because you may be believing that part of that is true about you, but you're not accepting it. You're not owning it. And that's why you're triggered Mm -hmm. and holding onto it. Whereas you're not going to care if someone calls you a frog, right? So the things (laughs) you hold on to are things that you, hmm, there's some work to do there. Why are you holding on to it? Yeah, it's because you slightly believe in it. And so let's get to that part because there are, you know, I like like to say that two triggers like are your biggest lesson. Mm -hmm. But say you recognize that you have a trigger, then what? (laughs) What do you do with it? Yeah, then, well, go within and ask yourself, why am I triggered? When did this, so where are you feeling it in your body? That can be really powerful. Mm -hmm. And when did it first come up? You can go back to that core memory and Mm -hmm. see and understand, okay, when did you learn it wasn't safe to be this, to be too much or too Mm -hmm. emotional, like whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. And notice the stories you're then telling yourself about that particular trait that you're not owning. And then it's up to you to start owning it, to humanize yourself as well. You know, all we can't be light without owning our darkness, right? We've got to own all parts of ourselves. So there's no bad, inherently bad traits, I believe. They're just, it's the meaning we give to them. And so, for example, I remember this is it was such an, a cool thing I went through a few months ago. I did like a shadow work session with a mentor and then we started talking about what I was triggered by, the haters and stuff, because I was holding on to a lot. And mm. then we're talking about being fake and how I was so triggered by it, like people calling me mm. fake. And I was like, what the hell are you talking about? How am I being fake? Like I just really held on to it. And she asked me, well, what does fake mean to you? And I said, fake means being dishonest. Um, yeah, just like dishonesty. And then she asked me, have you been dishonest? And I was like, oh, oh, (laughs) oh, okay. Okay. And I started touching my eyes and she's like, hmm, follow that reaction. So I started touching Uh my eyes and then I realized, well, the fakeness, quote unquote, that I saw within me was my dishonesty, which was me showing up as a filtered version of myself. I wasn't being completely mm-hmm. honestly myself because I was so afraid of people not liking me. And right. so that was the reflection I saw. And then so that was a huge breakthrough for me. 
I started to love and accept that part of me that was trying to be dishonest to protect myself, Mm. stop judging that part of me, but just observing it and seeing it as self-protective behavior and then of course showing up more honestly as myself but then a week later or a few days later I I woke up one day and my eyes were so puffy I could barely open them <laughs> and it's so interesting because I was touching them during our session and that was like where where I was feeling it in my body and so I feel like through breaking through that shadow my body was like detoxing and like suddenly my eyes were puffy I couldn't see for a day it was really random never experienced that before so it's funny your your body will go through things as well when you do this work yeah yeah and it's unexpected wow thanks for sharing that My love, I want to take a break and let you know that we just launched some new products on the Lavender shop and I am so excited about them. First, we have the Bloom hardcover notebooks. They come in three styles. These are beautifully made notebooks with a floral photo and gentle reminder on each cover. My favorite is the one that says, you're exactly where you're meant to be. It's the perfect reminder to have on your desk. I have mine on my nightstand so I can journal before I go to sleep. We've also launched the new TBH deck. So this is a deck of cards that are 120 prompts to spark honest conversations and deepen your relationship with yourself and others. You can use them to guide your journaling sessions or go beyond small talk and spark thoughtful conversations with the people in your life. Bloom into your best self and shop the new launch at shop.lavendaire.com. Again, that's shop.lavendaire.com. Where do you feel like you are now and what are you still working on? I guess, what are your greatest challenges now? Mm, I love that question too. I would say something I'm currently working through is still, you know, learning to separate my worth from achievement because that's something that was so ingrained in me as a little girl. It takes time to sometimes, you know, break free from certain patterns. And so it's like, feeling enough even if I haven't achieved a certain goal and finding you know, reclaiming my worth in other areas of my life too not just achievement or reaching monthly goals things like that <laughs> right and when you notice yourself kind of going back to the old habits of you know finding your self-worth in those previous things what do you do like do you have exercises or how do you deal with that as you're healing Yeah. Yeah. So if I notice myself feeling, let's say not good enough because I didn't uh, achieve a certain goal, I remember who I am outside of achievements. Like I'm so much more than that. And I like journaling is so just therapeutic and healing for me. So I'll just journal some things to myself, write a letter to little Jasmine as well, my inner child to remind her of all that she is beyond achievements, that she's always enough regardless. And just take, just taking, getting out of my head through, let's say, might go just help someone or create some content that that would just serve instead of focusing on not achieving my goals, right? So those are some things yeah. that help yeah. me. I'm also curious when, as you're creating content, what is your like, how does your inspiration work? Are you usually sharing things that you are trying to teach yourself or do you kind of set, create this whole plan? What does it look like? Mm, yeah, I never have had a social media plan or structure. It's whatever <laughs> that just comes through. Um, usually it's things that I have integrated or embodied because I find that if I teach things that I'm in the process of or I don't know much of, then that can sometimes lead to some imposter syndrome I found. So it's mainly things that I've, yeah, embodied, integrated, and and also just things that just come through sometimes that I just download. For example, this week I've been receiving so much inspiration. I'm in my ovulation phase, and that's when all the ideas, inspo is coming. But during my menstrual phase, like last a few weeks ago, I had no ideas coming. I was just in bed all week, basically. And yeah, so I just kind of trust in my phases and the cycles of me receiving inspiration as well. I love that. So you don't really try to force anything and you're not that strict about it. Um, Let's talk about cycles because I, you know, for people who don't know what these cycles are, like, do you work with the moon? You know, you mentioned your ovulation cycle. So what does it mean and how does it work? Yeah, so... The, so in terms of your 
um, menstrual cycle. We've got the menstrual phase, which is the first week, and then the follicular phase, which is the second week, which is when you start to um, start ovulating, and then ovulation phase is when you ovulate, and then mm-hmm. the luteal phase is that week before your period. Um, and how I work with it is mainly just being aware of it because sometimes you may think, oh, I'm feeling such a funk today. I feel low for no reason. I don't know what's happening, but it's Mm -hmm. probably because of your cycle. And it just gives you like this, uh, like an answer almost Mm -hmm. to why you may be feeling certain ways. And for example, I don't schedule too many calls, coaching calls during my um, menstrual week. Um, I like to do more HIIT workouts or heavier workouts during my ovulation phase because that's when I'm most energetic. And yeah, that's just how I work with it, being aware of how it shows up in my life. Is this sort of pattern, like more energy during ovulation, is it typical for women or would you say like everyone's energy is different at different parts of the cycle? Hmm, I I find it's the case most of the time because our hormones are at at their highest during our ovulation and the lowest Mm. during our menstruation so often it can be like that okay this is good to know because I I'm not that great at following and tracking that cycle but it's it is good to know because there are cycles that we're going through all the time and not feeling guilty when you're feeling low right yeah there are days where I don't want to do anything Mm. (laughs) but then there are other days where I have so much energy to do it so I yeah just honoring the cycles in life yeah yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, let's talk about your relationship with Josh, because now that you're together, you like you have more, I guess, coaching related to relationships. So first thing I want to ask is, do you do you believe that you have to be fully healed before meeting your significant other? Or do you feel like, you know, you can be a work in progress and, you know, work, work on healing together? Yeah, for sure. There's no such thing as fully healed, I believe. We're always going to be, it's a journey, not a destination. And I wasn't quote unquote fully healed when I met him. We're still each both doing our own healing work as well. So by no means do you have to at all take the pressure off of you. Because when you meet your partner or a partner, they're always going to reflect back things to you that you couldn't have done yourself when you were single. So yeah, your partner, having a partner can bring in a lot more healing work, which which can be a beautiful thing, of course. Yeah, yeah. Because I think a lot of people talk about, I mean, I've heard different points of view. Some people say you do want to be at least self-aware and partially healed before you meet someone. Because then if both of you are completely oblivious, then that leads to like a toxic relationship. And yeah, so, so I think there, it's like an interesting gray area, but definitely like fully healed is is a myth. (laughs) The the healing just keeps going on and on. So yeah. Yeah, Yeah, for sure. And yeah. So as long as you're willing to do the work and commit to the inner work, you know, that's, Mm -hmm. that's, that's doing your best. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, where are the areas that you find you clash with your significant other and how do you manage that? Mm Hmm. Hmm. I would say, hmm, I don't know if we clash in anything. <laughs> oh, I mean, of course, we've got different things. I mean, I, I know one comes to mind is Josh <laughs> likes to be very spontaneous. So I'm like the order to his chaos. He's the chaos to my order. I can be a very conscientious, orderly, specific facts kind of person. He's more like spontaneous, creative, um, th- that sort of thing. So sometimes you may want to do something really spontaneous and I'm like no but I've got to do this and it's like my orderly part of me comes out and so I don't know if it's a clash but we can challenge each other in those ways he I he challenges me to be more spontaneous get out of my comfort zone I challenge him to more structure and things like that yeah (laughs) Yeah, I think a healthy balance of that is that's healthy in every single relationship. You're not going to find someone who is the exact same as you. And if you did, you don't want to be with that person because you don't want to date yourself, right? So I think that sounds like a very healthy compliment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. Um, and well, something we've both had to work through is like conflict, for example. Both of us um, at the start of our relationship tended to avoid conflict because we were both uncomfortable with it uncomfortable with confrontation and bringing up things so we've definitely worked a lot through that and we're much it's much easier now to bring up 
maybe like quote unquote uncomfortable topics, but important things we need to talk through because we know that it it serves us. It doesn't serve us when we're both trying to avoid a conversation. Yes, yes. I feel like if, at least with me and my boyfriend, we've been together almost 15 years now, but whenever something bothers us, either of us, we say it right away or we, we don't hold, like, I think some people tend to keep things in because they don't want conflict or they don't want to make the other person mad or this or that. But Honest, honesty and communication truly are so important in a relationship, even if it hurts, even, even it can, if it can be difficult, like if you can be honest in the most graceful way possible, obviously I'm not saying, you know, point fingers and, and you know, argue, but it's about honest communication. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. And if you're both emotionally mature, it'll always figure itself out as long as you're willing to have those deeper conversations and when you allow yourself to be vulnerable and be seen that's how you create more intimacy and depth in your relationship more connection yeah yes I love that um okay so let's switch gears a little bit I want to hear about you know you moving to a new place like how did it feel how did it I guess was it difficult to find a new sense of community or friendships in Bali like what was that like yes it took me two years <laughs> to find friendships I'm so grateful I found some like-minded women here but it took time because I mean that was my own journey of healing my relationship with women yeah as well here let's hear about that yeah. like yeah. Where, what was your journey like you know before and where is it now yeah so I was, I experienced some, you know, hurt in high school with a group of girls I was hanging out with. And that really stayed with me for a long time until about just about last year when I started to really work on healing my relationship with women. And so I I was just afraid of getting hurt again with women. I was afraid of the comparison that might come up, competition, jealousy, things like that. I was told in my, to my face as a girl that from another girl, she said, she's jealous of me. I was told that in my face. So I felt like my whole, my existence was just going to be too much for some women and and friendships, real friendships aren't possible and things like that. And, um, just a lot of limiting beliefs, of course. And so I had to do a lot of healing around that. And it was just about getting clear on my stories that I was holding onto. It was about forgiveness as well. And it was about just awareness of how, women can really be conditioned to compete with one another. It's as if we've normalized, yeah, it's as if we've normalized jealousy, competition. Mm -hmm. And uh, because think about like things like the beauty industry, it's a multi-billion dollar industry for a reason because they thrive off us competing with each other, looking Mm -hmm. better, right? Mm -hmm. So just noticing how we're conditioned to, like that was really powerful for me because I'm like, I can uncondition myself now from this. And just being aware of, yeah, those those thoughts that still may come up, the conditioned thoughts, not the true jasmine thoughts. Um, Right. Yeah, it's about opening up my heart again too. I see. And so how how did you start to meet people and open up to them then? Yeah, it was really divine how some of the friendships I met here, because I remember, because I'm, when I manifest, I'm, like when I get super specific, it just spins. That's, that's how it works for me. So I love that. Yeah, like last year, I remember at one point I journaled. I was like, I'm in a phase in my life where I I'm gonna turn my focus a bit away from business for now, and I really want to focus more on friendships because it's really important for me. I journaled it. I remember and about who I want to hang out with, and then literally the next day, I was at my villa space. It's a shared area, and then these two women walk in and they find me because I don't see anyone else and they ask about the place and then we just ended up really connecting they're also Chinese like it just because I'm half Chinese as well so that was like just like oh my gosh like just the synchronicity of what happened and we exchanged numbers and we hung out a few times and that's how it happened so oh I love that like they literally came to you the next day yeah yeah (laughs) Let's talk yeah. about manifesting since this is such a huge theme in your life. And I think you even wrote an ebook about manifesting, correct? Yes. yes. So how give us your best tips for how to manifest what you want in life. Hmm. Best tips. Well, 
getting clear on what you desire, even if it's not super specific, at least knowing the direction you want to head towards. Surrounding yourself in environments that support you mentally, like mental health is so important. So surround yourself in great environments as best as you can. Get clear on the stories that may be holding you back, keeping you small, that no longer align with you, replacing them with empowering stories. Um, And I would say, think about, okay, if I already had this thing, or what do I fear happening if I have this thing? So for example, lots of people want to manifest more money, right? Some people may have stories that if they have more money, they may fear having more responsibility or being too overwhelmed or overworking, things like that. So if that's your fear and you don't want that, obviously you don't, it's a fear, then subconsciously you're going to find ways to actually not manifest that extra money because you're afraid of what would happen with it. So what do you fear would come with that desire? Work through that. You know, where do these fears come from? And then if you already had your desire right now, if it was already done without a shadow of a doubt, it's coming, who would you be? What's your identity? And make sure your identity now aligns with that. And that's the part I find most people can struggle with because they don't see it in their reality. So it's hard for them to Mm -hmm. be the person who has it, but it really comes down to that, having faith and and just believing that this version of you exists to align with it. Who do you need to be and be that now? Yeah. I love those tips. Really great. I hope you guys all took notes. (laughs) So Jasmine, how often do you manifest now? Or do you feel like you've manifested every, so many things that you already wanted? Yeah, I've manifested a lot, which I'm so grateful for. I guess what I'm manifesting next is we would love to build a villa in Bali. Mm. So that's something that's exciting. on the horizon. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, so just whatever, if something comes to mind, then I will just do my best to get it because if you want something, you can have it. That's just, yeah. that's just I the way. I see that already. <laughs> I see it in the future. And any tips? I mean, how do you, do you manifest with Josh together? How do you manifest with another person if you have like common goals? Yeah. I love that you brought this up actually, because we work really well as a team. So let's say, cause we move villas quite often, you know, finding long-term villas can be a bit tricky mm-hmm. here. Um, mm-hmm. And we've moved about 16 times in the past two wow. years. Wait, how long do you stay in one villa? Yeah. We used to do like one month or two months. Now we're doing more long-term because we realized how big of a job it is to find a villa to move into. (laughs) But when we're, so let's say when we're manifesting a villa, it's always like this. I hold the vision. I'm like, I hold the energy. I hold the faith. He's the one who goes and looks for it, like practically (laughs) takes the action. And it always works like that. And we always find a really amazing place. So that's how we teamwork. (laughs) you're like I'm here I'm holding the space you go yeah. you do it yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that yeah. yeah oh wow so you you've already moved 16 times so you've done that process 16 times mm-hmm. yes and all 16 times wow. it's like he ends up finding it like I can try I'll do it too but mm-hmm. just for some reason he always finds the place so I'm like okay this is how it is and I, I hold the energy I hold the faith the the vibration of already yeah. having a feel like he does the physical part. (laughs) Wow. I didn't realize that you had to move so often. That is very interesting. Um, Okay. What is next for Jasmine Lipska? Oh, what is next? Hmm. What is next? Embarking on this journey of coming home to my most authentic self, my unapologetic Mm. self. I love it. That's what I'm trying to do. I feel like we are all trying to do that. <laughs> but and, and it is getting clearer and clearer each year. I feel like each year we're like unraveling the layers that are not us. Um, yes. And do you have any last words that you want to share with our listeners? Hmm. Hmm. Well, since we've talked a lot about manifesting, I guess the message I just want to share is that if you believe something is possible, it is possible. And as cliche as that sounds, that's how it works. If you want something, you can go get it. And it takes work. It takes commitment and devotion. But if you just have faith and trust without a shadow of a doubt that your desires are meant for you, you can have it. And I believe in you. 
And I believe we're all here. We're all meant to shine. We're all meant to take up space. And I just hope we can all celebrate each other as well. You know, when you see someone else's wins and successes, celebrate that because they're not taking anything away from you. Nothing at all. If anything, they're just there showing you that, hey, it's possible for you as well. So I just hope we can celebrate each other more especially women to women, honoring each other, wanting to see each other win. And I really believe that's what will make the world a much better place. I agree completely. Thank you so much, Jasmine. Thank you for sharing your energy and your words with us. I I felt like what you just shared right now could be like a perfect audio clip that people (laughs) will want to reshare because your voice is so nice. So thank you so much. And oh, lastly, where can we find you online? Oh, you can find me at my website, which is jasminelipska.com or my Instagram, jasminelipska. And thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it, Eileen. Thank you.